Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Kyle Jamieson. Kyle Jamieson is uh, an associate professor at uh, University College London in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and he does pretty interesting work in cross-layer sort of physical layer and cross-layer sort of work. So uh, yesterday you saw uh, some of this work by Professor Sachin Katti, who was sort of showing you how completely new stuff can be done if you modify the physical layer and so on. So this is on similar theme, but you'll, for example, see how you can track. So you must be well aware of GPS, which lets you sort of track people outdoors. Uh, for example, the first talk that he's going to talk about is how you can modify Wi-Fi access points to track devices to a granularity of a few centimeters indoors, where GPS signals don't penetrate, for example. right? Uh, he'll also talk about some more things that he has done besides uh, locating devices, such as how can you enable security using uh, things like multipath, uh, unique multipath char characteristics in the environment, and so on? So okay. I'm sure you guys will enjoy this a lot because there's a lot of new stuff that you'll see here. Uh, yeah, so right. I'll just hand it over to Kylie now. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, can everyone hear me? Okay. So today I'll be talking to you about uh, kind of an arc of work um, that my students and I have been undertaking at uh, University College London for over the past uh, two to three years. Um, and the general theme of the work is bringing uh, phased array signal processing indoors to wireless networks. Okay? But um, first, a little bit of an introduction. So um, I'm sure many of you know, you know London for many things, but let me explain to you where I'm from um, in the context of the ARPANET. So the ARPANET, this is a map of the ARPANET back from 1973. And this is the precursor to the internet that the US Army designed. And this was how the uh, internet looked back in 73 when it was just, oh, you know, 20 or 30 nodes, okay? So I grew up in the US. I got my uh, degrees and my PhD from MIT in Massachusetts Institute of Technology over there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and then I moved over to London, uh, down there in the lower right-hand corner, which was the first uh, site outside of the U.S. on the ARPANET. And uh, what people, um, emeritus professors in my group, uh, did was they connected the U.S. ARPANET to London over satellite links that you see there in the picture. Um, so we were the first place outside of Finchan, so that's where I'm from. OK, so today I'll be talking to you about um, array processing, phased array processing. And this is kind of, these are the examples that really inspire my work. Thank you. Um, this is the inspiration that I uh, get. Um, phased array processing, if you don't know what it is, it's basically taking signals from an array of sensors. And these uh, arrays of sensors turn up in all kinds of different contexts, right? So now we have. Um, we have examples like uh, radio astronomy, where the array is this big set of satellite dishes spaced out hundreds of yards uh, apart. Um, it's used in weather radar. It's used in the military, uh, in the Navy especially, naval radar, and then uh, in terms of land-based radar as well. It's also used underground to detect earthquakes, detect and localize earthquakes and seismic events underground. Um, so it has such a broad applicability and so much power um, in this, in this uh, type of signal processing uh, that we'll look at today. The other broad theme of my work is opportunistic overhearing. Okay? So what can we do when we have these array sensors opportunistically overhearing transmissions that go on, be it outdoors or indoors in a Wi-Fi network? So this example I'm showing you here is from the search for uh, the missing aircraft, Malaysian Airlines 370, uh, went missing uh, months ago. So the search is still ongoing. And the most promising lead we have right now in the search for this aircraft comes from opportunistically overhearing 
just a few small transmissions that the aircraft's transponder uh, transmitted as, a, as routine uh, diagnostic data back to, its, uh, uh, to the airline company. Okay? And the London company in Marsat, their satellites picked up the, these, these transmissions, these diagnostic mechanical transmissions. Um, and we have our best guess as to where this missing aircraft is today, and then the search goes on. So these two themes, array processing and opportunistic overhearing, what I'm going to do today is try to convince you that these are useful not just outdoors in these contexts, but indoors in the indoor wireless environment, in wireless lands that we've been talking about um, in this summer school. Okay? And to do that, I'm going to tell you about three pieces of work um, that my students and I have undertaken over the past uh, two or three years. Um, first, I'll talk about ArrayTrack, the system that does very fine-grained, highly responsive indoor localization of Wi-Fi devices indoors. Um, next up, I'll talk about using array processing to enhance Wi-Fi security, some follow-on work to ArrayTrack. And then finally, I'm going to tell you how you can realize both these systems and other very interesting phased array systems um, indoors on commodity, commodity Wi-Fi access points. So any of those Wi-Fi access points you see up there on the walls uh, today that are deployed, um, Phaser is a system that lets you uh, realize these uh, algorithms right there. Okay, so let's begin with uh, array track. Okay, so the setup to array track is that we need precise indoor location systems for your device, your your um, your mobile phones, your tablets, um, and so on, your your glasses, perhaps. Um, today. Outdoors we have GPS. It's great for navigation, gives you meter accuracy, but the minute you go indoors, GPS starts to fade significantly, and it really doesn't work unless you're right next to a window, uh, and even then it usually doesn't work indoors. So imagine what we could do with precise and very, very rapid indoor localization on the glasses or the um, or the wearables, or your tablet, or your mobile phone, okay? So we could do augmented reality now, for real. So you could look at things in the environment, and your glasses would know exactly where they were, and, you could, uh, and the glasses could tell you uh, things about what is nearby, or, or who is nearby. Um, if you're a customer shopping for products in a supermarket, perhaps you might like to have information about the um, about the food that's in the supermarket pop up on your glasses or your mobile as you're browsing on the store. Right? Certainly many supermarkets, um, Tesco in the UK, um, other supermarkets are very interested in this. Libraries, museums, uh, there's a lot of interest in fine-grained location to let people know what they're looking at in, in these types of places. Um, problem is, current indoor Localization technologies, for the most part, they're not accurate or rapid enough, and they require this calibration step, which is basically what you do when you're setting up the system. It requires a human being to go and walk around um, and carrying a phone and, cal and with a known location, calibrating the location system. Right? So many of you will be familiar with uh, the work that Victor Ball and his, his group at Microsoft Redmond have done on radar, which was one of the pioneering indoor uh, location systems, a system called radar. Um, and it was, it's, the technology is still used today, but it does require this calibration step, as do many other follow-on works uh, from radar. You know, localization is a very well-studied problem, and so um, people have looked at using ultrasound and, and uh, the, the camera for localization. Um, but what we're interested in doing is doing this using just the existing AP, Wi-Fi AP infrastructure, right? And these solutions that um, rely on technologies like ultrasound, they require this dedicated infrastructure to be installed uh, in the building that you are um, interested in tracking people in. 
Okay, so as I say, it's a very well-studied area. And the general trend as we look uh, from work back uh, to, to 1992, the general trend is that uh, we are getting better and better accuracy indoors uh, for location. So back then we were talking about meters of accuracy for Wi-Fi based location. Um, this is the active bat and the badge system at uh, Cambridge University. One, uh, another one of the pioneers with uh, Victor Ball with radar. Um, Horus system came in refined radar. And we have these image based systems. Um, but the system I'll tell you about today, array track, um, is one of the most accurate to date, even today. Um, and we were able to achieve a median 23 centimeter accuracy indoors uh, just from a couple of packet transmissions. Um, so let me tell you how we go about doing that. Okay, the observation that we start with, with array track, is that APs um, you are getting more and more antennas. Why is this, right? So you've been hearing, uh, and you will hear uh, in the summer school, um, about MIMO technology. So MIMO technology is using multiple antennas to either stripe data across uh, the link formed by those many antennas on both sides of the link or to increase the reliability. Okay, so this MIMO technology started out, you know, around the, the theory was, was, um, was solidified back in the 90s and MIMO started getting deployed in the late 90s and the, and the 2000s. Um, and it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a great success, right? So it's been standardized in N and AC, as you've heard, um, and it's increasing throughput and reliability uh, to no end, really. Um, the reason is that you get, you get synergistic wins with multiple antennas, okay? You can do a, a MIMO with multiple antennas across one link, right, and make a faster or more reliable link. But what AC does is it does MIMO in order to share the wireless medium between different clients, many links, okay? So this is more and more reason to add more antennas because with more antennas, you can do both. You can make better links and you can share the medium with more clients, okay? So the observation, coming back to array track, the observation we make with array track is that access points are, are already increasing in terms of the number of antennas they have. And because of these uh, MIMO links and spatial multiplexing uh, sharing, they have every incentive to keep increasing the number of antennas at APs. Uh, and we already see 60 antenna APs today. Okay, so what can we do with all these antennas? And here's a little bit of uh, theory for you that you'll be familiar with um, if you studied uh, some <coughs> array processing uh, yourself in your electrical engineering uh, program. So what we have here is a client sending a frame, a short uh, burst, to the AP. The AP here has multiple antennas. Let's just take two antennas to make things simple. Okay? And the client is at some bearing theta to the AP, and he's transmitting with a carrier wave that's typically 2.4 or 5 gigahertz uh, in the case of Wi-Fi. And what we see is that when this signal reaches the first antenna, it travels some additional distance. You can imagine the, the, the transmission as a planar wave, really, that's propagating um, in, a, in a perpendicular front, okay, arriving at the AP. And it'll travel some additional distance over to antenna two that I've highlighted here in green. Okay, so it reaches antenna one first. It travels that additional green distance and reaches antenna two. And the observation that these algorithms, these signal processing algorithms make is that additional green distance is related to the bearing theta that the transmission came at the AP. So this is angle of arrival of the transmission at the AP. And when we, when we look at the signal at the baseband, this is representing the phase and the amplitude of the signal um, as a, a point in the complex plane. You can represent the received signal at antenna 1 as this x here. 
And then antenna 2 will see another signal that's been rotated by that additional distance. And the relationship between the additional distance it travels and the phase is related to, to two things, both the wavelength of the signal, which we already know, lambda, and the bearing that the signal arrives at the axis point. So we have this nice little, rota uh, li nice little relationship between the phase difference of the two signals at antenna 1 and antenna 2, the two received signals, and the bearing of the client to the axis point. And that is the essence of how these angle of arrival algorithms work. So if we are in a line of sight environment, the phase we measure is going to directly tell us the client's bearing to the AP. And this is what mostly happens outdoors when we don't have so many reflectors, say we're, we're airplanes in the sky, we don't have so many reflectors around. Um, this relationship is, is nice and simple. But indoors, the situation is more complex. And it turns out that this general principle can be generalized to environments that do have multipath reflections. And this is called the music algorithm. It's classic. It's back from 1979. And it allows us to form these AOA spectra, angle of arrival spectra, from transmissions um, as they arrive at an AP. And what this graph is, this is a polar plot, and it's telling you, based on these phase measurements between pairs of antennas, so now, in general, for the music algorithm, we, we have and we need more than two antennas to resolve multiple multipath reflections of the signal as it, as it arrives at the AP. Okay? But once we have multiple antennas, the music algorithm will give us an estimate of the power of the incoming signal as a function of angle at the AP. So this plot is telling us that somebody transmitted to the AP an energy arrived from this direction, this physical direction, and that physical direction. We have some side lobes here. Okay, okay so now we know about AOA spectra. Now let me give you the high level view from a thousand feet of how a ray track works. Okay? So it's a it's a listening system where clients, mobiles, they send just a single packet and they don't have to be modified at all. No changes on the mobile side. Okay? That's important because you don't want to convince the world to run an app on their smartphones necessarily. A client sends a single packet and then all the nearby APs over here. So here we have that opportunistic overhearing theme come in. They overhear and they compute angles of arrival. And they compute those AOA spectra, send them to the backend server, server. The backend server then thinks about associating each one of these AOA spectra <coughs> with the mobile's transmission. So matching up which came from which packet, because there's packets flying about all over the place, right? And then the backend server then estimates location based on the spectra, on the pseudo spectra. Okay? So the key step here is location estimation. And when we began this work, we thought, kind of naively, we thought, oh, triangulation should work okay indoors. Okay? But there's two serious problems that we run into with triangulation. And that's this multipath radio reflection indoors. Okay? So the client transmits something, and nearby objects in the environment, in the wireless environment, reflect walls, doors, uh, even people reflect RF signals uh, to some extent. Okay? So that energy arrives at the AP. And if we're using just triangulation, the other thing that you'll notice is the direct path, the one we're interested in, that gives us the right location to the client, that may be blocked, or it might be even completely obstructed. So now, when the AP computes the pseudo-spectrum, that direct path may 
uh, the reflections may dominate the direct path, giving up, throwing off our location estimate. estimate. So we said, OK, how often does this happen? All right. So we got 30 Socris Wi-Fi clients. And here's where the work kind of turned very experimental. And that's what I want you to kind of notice about uh, how we go about solving the problem. You know, we, we know about multipath, but really, how often does this happen indoors? And the only way to know for sure is to go out and build it and do it. All right. So we got put 30 Socris clients um, in, our, uh, in our office space. Um, and you notice the AP is out here in the um, open plan area. And clients are in offices, and they're going through multiple walls, two, three, four walls, until they reach the AP. And the signal's bouncing around all over the place. Right? So if we look on the pseudospectra at the location of the peak that is biggest, right? if you're just doing triangulation, you'll take the, the biggest peak. Okay? That's on the y-axis here. And then the ground truth bearing of the client to the axis point is on the x-axis. So x equals y means we got it right. And you see that about 20% of the time, right, multipath has thrown us off. Okay? And by the way, we did this on the uh, Rice Warp version 2 platform, uh, which I think you guys will be uh, experimenting with later on in the, in the summer school. OK? So how are we going to overcome this problem? Well, the observation is that we can combine pseudospectra to overcome the multipath. Right? So we know the pseudospectra from many APs, not just one. And the observation is that the multipath reflections, if they throw off one AP, they're unlikely to throw off another AP in exactly the same way. Okay? So if we have a, a candidate location X here that we're interested in, in testing whether X is where the client is, okay? we can draw lines to each AP, and that will give us points on the pseudospectra that yield the probability that the client is at X from AP1's perspective and from AP2's perspective and so on. Okay? So we compute that probability as the multiplica multiplication of those likelihoods. And then we build a heat map of probability in space. Okay? So darker is more likely. Here's the client's true location. And here's the first AP. Okay? The first AP just tells us bearing. So the heat map is radial, has this radial pattern that you see here. But once we add another AP, you see we triangulate in on the client's location. But also, you see we, the multipath effect. And if this multipath effect is strong enough, we'll misestimate the client's location down here. Because this AP sees a reflection in this direction. Okay? But we keep adding. Here we added a third AP. And this was enough in this example to cancel the multipath and make the true location the location a ray track gives us. So we got the location right. Okay? So the observation is that multipath tends to cancel out when we add APs, but the direct path tends to jointly reinforce across that multiplication of probabilities. So that's what we leverage in a ray track. And that's why we get such good uh, location accuracy. The other thing we did was we looked at, to, to, to further improve accuracy, was we looked at the effect of moving a client ever so slightly on two packet transmissions. Okay? So here's the first transmission. And you see that the first transmission will bounce off certain objects in the environment, okay? but not others, just by virtue of their of their placement. Okay, so you can do, do some ray tracing thinking here. And you'll notice that the transmission will bounce off certain objects uh, when the client is here. But if the client were to move slightly, it would bounce off other objects. Okay? However, the slight movement of the client means that the direct path, 
okay, to the AP, which is these two lobes, right? So the AP is computed here, two pseudospectrum, the red one from the first transmission, the blue one from the second transmission, okay? And the slight movement of the client means that the direct path has changed very little. But the different objects, the different bounces, means that the, the reflection paths change quite a bit, okay? So the takeaway observation that uh, Gia, my student, uh, noticed is that the direct path tends to exhibit more stability than the reflection paths when clients move and transmit. So he came up with this algorithm to cancel even more multipath when we have two packet transmissions. What he does is he finds the, the peaks in the first red AOA spectrum, he finds the peaks in the second AOA spectrum, and then he suppresses the peaks if they're not paired up with each other. Okay, so the, here you see the direct path is paired with the direct path in the other pseudospectrum. So he keeps that. But the multipaths are not paired, so he removes those peaks, and we're left with a direct path peak. Okay, so motion-based multipath suppression is the other technique. Okay, so again, the system building component. So we realized the whole system on warps, eight antenna warps, Socrus clients. Um, these results I'm showing you are 33 clients, one floor of an office space, lots of non-line-of-sight propagation, lots of walls. Um, we got the ground truth using architectural drawings and a laser measure, measured out the ground truth. Um, and in terms of accuracy, the red curve is showing you a ray tracks accuracy, median uh, 20, 23 centimeter accuracy. The blue curve here is showing you the accuracy that an oracle algorithm would achieve if it took the right set of APs, okay, that didn't have multipath, if it just somehow knew, okay. So this is not a real this is not a real system, the blue curve, but it's showing you kind of the accuracy possible in the data, and that's pretty high. So median what five centimeter accuracy over one floor, okay, very high. So we don't know how to extract this accuracy, but it seems like there's even more uh, accuracy possible, all right? And here we're showing you uh, accuracy results using fewer APs. So these are six AP results. How well does it work with five, four, three APs? Uh, it degrades slightly down to like one meter median accuracy. Yeah. But what is the distance between um, the client and the user? So average a few meters. A few meters, yeah. But through walls. But that's a good, that's a very fair question. Yes. Are these localization results applicable for planar placement of the, do you do 2D localization? You also do 3D localization? Yes, so we do, so this system did 2D localization. The system I'll talk about in the third uh, part of this talk it does a little bit of 3D localization. Uh, these results, yes, are planar. Yeah. Was there another question? Yeah. Uh, is it necessary that the AP, there should be at least one AP in the line of sight? If all no APs on the line of sight, then what uh, In some cases, yes, there were no APs in the line of sight, but we did have enough uh, attenuated direct paths for the reinforcement to happen. Uh, but in general, yeah, it, the more line of sight, so line of sight is, is, a, is a continuum, right? So in general, yes, the more line of sight you are, uh, the better you'll do. And these situations you refer to, they're, they're from, they, they make up the tail of the distribution. So in the worst case, we were one meter accurate with six APs, right? Is this music algorithm and the root music algorithm? Music. That's right. We didn't use root music. We did use spatial smoothing, which you might be also be familiar with. So my question is, suppose you want to do the 3D localization. Yes. Can you reduce it to a bunch of 2D localization problems? Yes, I'll talk about that actually at the end, uh, and, and after we can talk about that. That's exactly what we do. 
Uh, let me press onward uh, just for, for uh, time. So I'm going to play you very quickly. I'm going to play you a video um, where we actually show a ray track being realized on the phaser platform. So this here is the phaser platform that I'll talk about later. Commodity Wi-Fi, three antenna um, access points. So this is the next version uh, of the system. We deployed them on the ceiling. Um, and here you see the live results. The box is one meter. We have four APs here. Um, phones on the table. The red dots here are the location. And John is going to pick it up and tell you how he moves the phone over to the other table. And you, you can see it being tracked here uh, live and in real time. So that's a ray track running atop phaser. OK, uh, let me keep going, because uh, I'm running a little bit short on time. Um, second system I'll tell you about is called Secure Array. Okay? And what we said with this system was, OK, we have this angle of arrival information at all our APs. What if we use these as fingerprints, since they're so unstable? Can we use these as fingerprints to improve Wi-Fi security? OK? So we went and we looked at uh, what do we do with, for Wi-Fi security. And for the most part, it's at the link layer in 802.11. And it's protocol based. Um, and if you look at kind of what has happened, WEP was the first protocol a security protocol for 802.11. It was introduced back in 1999. Um, and it was so insecure. You know, internet research, researchers knew it was insecure basically the moment it was released. And um, it's been cracked and is, is no longer in use. Uh, it's been, there, are, there are attacks that crack web in seconds, basically. Okay? So then Cisco introduced a, uh, an improvement to web called Leap. Two years later, it's cracked. Um, WPA was standardized in 03. Um, four years later, it was cracked. WPA2 was standardized in 2007. And now, just recently, we're starting to discover flaws in 802.11w, uh, another name for WPA2. Okay? So this is a history of protocol-based security being introduced and then exploited and cracked. Okay, so what can we do um, to break this? And I would uh, submit to you the answer is uh, to use a physical layer approach in conjunction with protocol-based security. So let me tell you, I hope we'll, th this will become clear how, how I propose to do that uh, by the end of this section. But the observation that we make um, is the AOA spectrum has these properties of being very unique uh, and very stable, okay? unlike other measurements that you might take um, in the wireless domain, like the channel impulse response. Okay? And here's why. Right? So if client A transmits, the access point, as you know, gets this AOA spectrum because of multipath reflections in the environment. And client B transmits, the access at a different location, the access point will get a completely different AOA spectrum. Why is this? Because the reflectors in the environment are different for client B than they are for client A, just because of the angles, just because of the location, really, of the two clients. So multipath, like MIMO, multipath becomes an advantage here in making the AOA spectrum unique and stable. Okay, And if we're within this short period of time called the channel coherence time, typically it's milliseconds at walking speeds and, and uh, Wi-Fi uh, frequencies. If we're within the channel coherence time, the channel isn't going to change very much. Right? It's going to be quite stable. And so these AOA signatures will also be stable. So we thought to ourselves, can we use AOA spectra as client signatures to flag active attacks when clients transmit and try and, and break the pro security protocol running at the access point? Okay. So our threat model is as follows. The client, the uh, attacker rather, is going to be at a different location than the legitimate client. 
And the attacker is going to be transmitting 8 or 2 11 frames in some kind of active attack. And we'll even give the client an omni or a directional or. We'll, we'll say that the attacker can have a phased array antenna so that he can transmit energy in whatever directions he likes okay, to try and fool the access point. Okay. But notice that even if the attacker has a phased array, what we're measuring here is angle of arrival at the receiving access point, not at the, at the uh, attacker or client. So the attacker needs those reflectors to be at exactly the right locations to match up and fool a check against um, a check of a, a check comparison of two pseudospectra. And that's just very unlikely to happen. Okay, so here's our algorithm. We take the set of peaks in each of the two signatures from packets, AOA signatures, from packets that we want to compare. And we calculate a similarity metric between those two peaks, between those, sorry, between those two AOA spectra. And the metric is looking at the magnitude of each peak normalized, given that each peak is some angle distance away from the, uh, the other. Okay, so we have two signatures we want to compare, say the red and the green. So we line them up, we take the peaks, and we see the, here the red and the green peaks are completely different angles, so the metric will be zero. Now let's compare the red and the blue um, packets. Right? We see one peak here that matches very closely, and some other peaks in the blue uh, packet that don't match, so the, this pair gets a higher metric. Okay? Then we use a threshold test, so if our metric is under some threshold eta, the, the signatures are going to match each other, and we say that's from the same client. If the, if the metric is over some threshold eta, the signatures will differ, and the system will say that these two packets are from two different clients. Okay? So this is allowing us to say whether two packets are from the same client or not. The other effect that we have is, remember our um, relationship between, uh, in the phased array between physical bearing to the axis point, theta, and the measured phase difference, pi sine theta. Now when we have estimates of theta, you might ask yourself, what's the sensitivity of that bearing estimate to a small error in the measured phase omega. And it turns out that if you take the look at the slope of this, uh, of this function, the sensitivity is, is highest when the client is at the end, end fire to the linear array, and lowest when the client is broadside to the linear array. Okay? And this matters in terms of distinguishing angles so we want to equalize the sensitivity. So we have another step where we introduce a random phase perturbation to both measured signals and compute a new similarity metric that averages the resulting metrics from each of these phase um, perturbations. And that's our final metric in secure array. So what we see here is this perturbation process takes attackers' packets that look rather similar because the attacker and the client were broadside mostly to the array, and it maps them to pseudospectra, uh, AOA spectra rather, that look quite different and receive low metrics. Okay, so this allows us to be more selective in terms of flagging attacks, right? Yet it retains um, you know, uh, it retains suppressing the false alarms when the when a client is transmitting and we're comparing the client's packets with itself. 
Okay, so how does this fit now? Yeah. Right, right. Yes, so we, we need to do it when the client, in such a small period of time, that the client is essentially stationary. So that's the wireless channel coherence time I was talking about before. So let, this example will, um, will make it clear. Uh, let me take this question as well. Yeah. Ah, okay. So there's no, there's no calibration needed for, to, because the AP isn't actually determining physical angles of arrival. It's just comparing the two AOA spectra. Okay, so on the other hand, the, the comparison between these two packets needs to, hap to happen when, the client I when a legitimate client is essentially stationary. Okay, so what we, what we rely on is that we rely on the comparison. We only make the comparison within some small uh, fraction of time delta t that in this case is one millisecond. So essentially, the client it will be stationary for that one millisecond, and we can correctly um, not give false alarms if the client is, say, walking. And I'll show you, um, I have results, actually, for walking speed mobility. Right? So this attack is showing you how this whole thing integrates with, um, with 802.11 WPA2. Okay? So this is the cutting edge um, 802.11 security protocol but it has this deadlock attack. It's called the dead, uh, deauthentication deadlock attack um, that an attacker can mount during this four-way handshake when the client is first connecting to the AP. Okay, so when the client is connecting to the AP, all these frames are unauthenticated by 8 or 11 um, I. All right, and so. The AP is just trusting that these, are, these frames currently are from the client. And the attack involves injecting a deauthentication frame right in between messages three and four of that handshaking protocol. Okay? So what would you need to mount this attack? Well, we ran number of uh, runs of the authentication protocol in our uh, test bed, and we measure the time between messages three and four. Okay, so this is um, in between the AP transmitting message three and receiving message four. And in every case, this runs in less than one millisecond. So the attacker would need to transmit or uh, one frame at exactly the right time or transmit a string of frames in order to inject that deauthentication packet at j within a one millisecond window. Okay? That's within the wireless channel coherence time, and that means that um, Secure Array can make a comparison between the signature of any deauthentication packet and the signature of the fourth message in the handshaking protocol. And if these two signatures match, we know that, that the message actually came from the legitimate client. If they don't match, we know that it didn't come from the client, and, the, and it came from somebody who has no business sending a de-auth message in the name of the client. Right? And we can drop that de-auth packet and thwart the attack. Okay. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, OK, that's fine. But what if the attacker has directional antennas? Okay, so there's another attack that's popular on 802.11i, um, WPA2, um, in which, uh, and this is actually, people carry out this attack. Um, the attacker gets two directional antennas and transmits frames on both, okay? And on one directional antenna, he aims it at the um, AP, and he tries to jam the reception of message four in the handshake, okay? Thinking to himself, okay, well, you know, I'm going to replace message four with my own message, okay? 
And the way he does this is he jams the reception, and then with his other antenna, he aims that at the client, and he records a copy of EA Paul message four, right? And then replays that copy later, right? So he's essentially intercepted. It's a kind of a man in the middle attack where he's intercepted the message from the client, replayed it, and transmitted to the access point. The thing that and and oh, before then he injects a deauthentication packet uh, to break the protocol. So now he's essentially he's he's hijacked the connection set up, as it's set up uh, between the client and the legitimate AP, and nobody knows any anything better. What we uh, what we do though is we see that when we uh, when the attacker jams um, EA Paul message four. Secure Array can detect that jamming because in the angle of arrival signature, what Secure Array will see will be the superposition of the uh, client and the attacker uh, transmissions at the AP in terms of angle of arrival. All right, so it's just energy going out and being received by the AP, and so that received energy adds up and music picks up that addition and shows us the superposition. And so Secure Array can detect this superposition and distinguish it and flag this attack as well. Right? So very versatile use of angle of arrival. Okay. So now in terms of uh, evaluation and seeing how well this works, I'll show you two results. You can uh, look at the paper uh, to see uh, results in the case of mobility and also um, varying number of antennas. But today I'll, I'll tell you about overall for, uh, attack detection rates and then uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about what will happen if the attacker is very close to the client. Okay? So again, a test bad evaluation. We, um, we had, this time we used many, many positions in our test bed looking at uh, warp uh, the warp platform. And here's the receiver operating characteristic curve. This is the attack detection rate against the false alarm rate of the system. Okay? So attack detection rate, this is an attack was actually ongoing and we correctly flagged that attack. And false alarm rate was uh, a legitimate client is transmitting and we made the comparison and how often did we raise a false alarm? Okay, so for the ROS ROC curve, a perfect system will be a, a curve that goes up to the left-hand corner and over, and the lower down we are, the worse. And note the log scale here on the x-axis. Okay, varying the threshold moves us along that ROC curve. So we picked a threshold based on experimental data of 0.7. And in terms of just comparing raw AOA signatures, we have this blue curve here. Secure array with the perturbation scheme gives us this red, nice red curve here where we're achieving a uh, less than 0.01 false alarm rate and a near 100% uh, attack uh, detection rate. Okay, so you might be at wondering how well does this work when the uh, attacker moves very close to the client? So <coughs> say I'm the attacker, and I put my attack device, maybe a phone, in the legitimate client's backpack and attack him that way, right? So we now, we change the distance between the client and the attacker going from three meters down to five centimeters, and we see low error rates, low uh, miss rates and false alarm rates, all the way up to about 10 centimeters. Even five centimeters, our, our, um, our miss rate isn't too bad. Right? So we can, so this multipath specificity is coming into play at distances of just five centimeters. And that makes sense in retrospect because the wireless wavelength at 2.4 gigahertz is 12 centimeters. Right? So the channel is going to change quite a bit at six centimeters, half that wavelength. 
So in retrospect, this kind of makes sense. All right, so in the five minutes I have remaining, I'm going to tell you what I can um, about Phaser, which is bringing um, these two systems, Array Track and Secure Array, uh, to existing Wi-Fi APs. And this is work I did with um, my students, John and Gia, and staff Graham. Uh, John was the guy you saw in the, uh, in the video just now. All right. All right, so phased array uh, signal processing. So people in the research community, not just me, um, but um, other researchers uh, in, the, in the research community uh, Sham Golakata at University of uh, Washington, Dina Katabi at MIT. Um, we've been, uh, we've been uh, pursuing many, many applications of phased array uh, signal processing. So Sham's been doing some, some great work on indoor uh, radar for gesture recognition. Um, I told you about Secure Array and um, Array Track. And what we worked on here with Phaser is how can we bring these applications to every existing Wi-Fi AP and deploy them right now? Okay? It turns out array processing is really challenging on these uh, commodity APs. So you get your Linksys AP, you take it, it has three antennas or two antennas, L so few antennas that are going to really limit the fidelity of these music algorithms um, that we use. But it doesn't just uh, stop there. right? So these, um, these oscillators on these uh, um, commodity APs, they're completely unsynchronized. So remember that to do all this uh, phased array processing, we were measuring phase at the baseband. It turns out that the oscillators that run on these uh, radios, they also alter phase when they down convert the signal from the, rate from the RF bands to baseband over here. Okay? So um, it's just a fact I'll ask you to take on, on faith that these oscillators change the phase. So when, they, when you power up the radio, these oscillators you can think of as, as a spinning clock. And they're frequency locked, meaning they're spinning at all the same rate, but they're not phase locked. So they're introducing these random phases, phi 0 and phi 1. Okay. What that means is you can do MIMO using this setup, great, but you can't do the phased array processing to determine the physical angles of arrival if you have these random phase offsets. So that completely breaks, um, it completely breaks phased array processing. And the third challenge is uh, what uh, somebody in the front row mentioned was this elevation differences between APs, which are normally up high, and, uh, and clients. And these, these elevation distances, differences distort uh, the readings. Okay. But it's more than that. So when we look at, um, when we look at uh, the, the signal we receive from multiple NICs, the first thing we thought about was, OK, hey, let's, let's take multiple NICs, multiple uh, Wi-Fi cards in one AP to give us more antennas. Okay? The challenge we immediately found was these NICs are going to measure the channel at different instances in time. So the packet comes in, and card 1 has one view of the, of the uh, signal in the time domain here. And card 2 has a completely different uh, view of the signal, because it's, it's locked onto the packet a few nanoseconds later than card 2 locked on, uh, 1 locked onto the packet. The other challenge we have when we introduce multiple NICs to an AP is that the oscillators are, are now, between NIC1 and not NIC2, now they're spinning at different rates. They're not frequency locked. Right? So again, this breaks phased array processing completely. And then finally, if we look at the rate at which the NICs are sampling the signal, that sampling rate is different between different NICs because they drive the sampling clock typically off the RF clock as well. So the approach we take in the first part of the phaser platform is a multi-card synchronization architecture 
What we do is we sacrifice one radio chain per NIC, and we have a shared antenna up in the uh, upper left-hand corner there, which gives us a phase reference between NIC1 and NIC2. Radio 1 on NIC1 and Radio 1 on NIC2. And once we have that phase reference, we make this observation about, um, about uh, shifts in the time domain and phase rotations in the time domain. And you remember from your Fourier math that if we shift a signal in the time domain, that becomes a rotation in the frequency domain that's dependent on the subcarrier, the OFDM subcarrier that we're looking at. So these cards are giving us frequency domain information. And likewise, phase uh, rotations in the time domain become phase rotations in the frequency domain. So we observe if we can correct the phase in the frequency domain, we can now synchronize up these uh, NICs. Okay, so that's fine. We've synchronized one radio from each of the two NICs, but we still have this problem of the oscillators on one NIC not being, uh, starting up with random phases and giving us problems for phased array processing. So we, we, want, we want to find this set of random startup phases, and then we can accurately measure the phase. So what John came up with is this algorithm called auto-calibration. And it basically works as follows. You have an AP overhearing a few transmissions. They might be from other APs, and the assumption is that we know the location of the other APs, or they might be from clients that we've localized. Maybe the other APs have cooperated to localize a client, and the AP that's coming up is trying to auto-calibrate. Okay? So if the client, if the AP overhears the transmission that it knows the location of, it can then walk through possible sets of um, phase offsets, as you see here in the animation, and, and compute pseudo uh, AOA spectra using those uh, candidate phase offsets. Okay, so that's the red pseudospectra here that you see morphing. So this is walking through different phase offsets from each of the two pairs in a three antenna NIC. And then it can measure the similarity of a pseudospectra with the true bearing. So right there, it would calculate a high metric, very similar to the metric we used in Secure Array. And then it'll combine, so that, that, gives us, that gives us one preferred set of phase offsets um, for that AP, and then it does the same thing for a transmission coming from a different true bearing, okay? And jointly computes the most likely set of phase offsets, okay? So the observation, again, similar to a ray tracks observation, if we overhear transmissions from at least two um, sources, the multipath propagation that we have will likely cancel and will likely be locking on to the right phase offset. Okay. And I think I'm out of time, but I'll quickly go over elevation uh, uh, compensation. So this was the picture before with the planar um, world where a client was transmitting to an access point and we were measuring phase difference. With an elevation component, what the antennas at the AP will measure will be a phase difference due to the azimuth, the bearing of the client to the AP, but also to, to the elevation difference between the client and the AP. And we've highlighted this elevation phase uh, response in blue here. The upshot of that is instead of, now, uh, instead of now AOA spectra or pseudospectra, what we have at an AP is something called a, we call a pseudo map, which is likelihood versus angle and range. Okay, so these are heat maps with the AP here at the center, and brighter is more likelihood. So with no height difference, we have a radial pattern, like we saw before with a ray track. 
But as we, have a, as we introduce a height difference, one transmission at an AP gives us this kind of bending um, probability of client's location, right? Very interesting patterns. So we basically, um, we've basically done the math to compute the added um, phase due to the elevation and test a number of candidate elevation locations for a client running a ray track in parallel over those candidate elevation, uh, elevations for each client. And the result is um, we get a significant improvement in accuracy of a ray track. So this is a ray track now. The results um, are much worse in terms of absolute location error because we're, now we're at 5 gigahertz um, and we're using 5 antenna APs. Um, but we get a significant uh, improvement in uh, the average location error with that elevation compensation. All right, so let me wrap up here. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that phased array, si array signal processing is useful indoors um, with these three systems that are bringing it indoors, array track, secure array, and phaser. And we're going to make uh, these systems available um, to you for experimentation. And I think the takeaway question I want to leave you with is what can you build with uh, phased array processing? Um, once you are using uh, systems like these? What applications can you think of um, that kind of look across the layers of the, of the networking stack um, and, uh, and do some interesting stuff? So thank you for listening. It's okay, I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the question was in Secure Array, we're using a signature, and what was the signature exactly? And the signature is um, an AOA spectra, right? And it's repeated. So we add like five or so phase perturbations to the AOA um, signature. And we use each of those to compare. So the signature itself is a perturbed AOA signature. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. So the random phase that you get, right, is it very hard for the radio manufacturer to say, OK, we'll give you uh, zero phase at boot up or things like that? Is there a fundamental reason why it has to be random phase? So the question was, is there, a, is there a fundamental reason why we have a random phase offset at boot up? Um, no, there's no fundamental reason. It would, well, okay, so it, it would be difficult and, and expensive for AP manufacturers to calibrate the, uh, the array, the, their APs because that would require knowledge of the APs antenna arrangements, right? And then feed that in down to the baseband. So it can be done, and if the ma AP manufacturers choose to do it, yes, they could release products that give us zero phase on boot up, um, but we would still need to run you know, some kind of elevation compensation, basically. But they, the problem is they don't have the incentive to do that, because for MIMO, they don't need to do that. Right? So MIMO will work with random fixed initial phases just Except fine. Except if you want to do distributed MIMO, in which case, again, the same problem occurs, right? So even distributed MIMO, uh, what you can do is you can receive, okay, and then you can turn around and transmit. And you want to transmit beamform, but since you've taken a channel measurement on the receive side, you can turn around and transmit, and the receive, the, those random phases will cancel in that case. So this is just measuring, you know, from out of the blue, a signal that you need to, that calibration step. So it's, 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 it's in a sense, it's niche, right? 
in terms of MIMO, yeah. Ah. So just regarding another application for your phased array, so you mentioned you can detect collisions easily. Yeah. And I guess Bhaskar was talking about collision as a big reason why rate adaptation fails, and so maybe collision notification is an application. Yes, absolutely, yes. So um, people have looked at various, um, various uh, physical layer baseband signal uh, signal looking at the the, uh, the trend uh, as collision notification as well, uh, but yeah, AOA is another option. Yeah. You're going to get a, when there is a collision, you're going to get a totally different signature because you don't know what the source of the signal is. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, it can be learned by looking at the physical layer uh, big error pattern, rather uh, big error probability pattern. So one thing. Yeah. yeah. So anyone looking for a research, research topic, better collision detection using using time series and AO analysis right there. So just a question to ask, right? The collisions you said in your, is it between clients, just two clients colliding, or is it maybe col clients colliding with AP, in which case, I don't know how this can help. Do you know? Uh, collisions I mentioned were collision with the AP, some other radio colliding with, with the AP. In that case, this is, I don't know whether angle of arrival works with self-interference cancellation. <laughs> so that's what we want. <laughs> right, so we need to combine, we need to combine AOA, uh, Sachin's work on uh, self-interference cancellation and, uh, and Bhaskar's work, yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> that's interesting how the that's ideas combine. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah.